Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Yeah, I'm, open, I'm, on, I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and I'm, I know it's a black moon. I'm, yeah. like, I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Today's guest, none other than Mr Nash Bait. That's so Max Hendry. But before I get Max in... I've got Mikey Wilson for a bit of Nash News. Mikey, how are you, mate? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm living the dream, aren't I? I'm with you in the studio. Wednesday morning. <laughs> Sunny. Does life get any better? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, normally on Nash News, we have like a, a sort of a talking point that we pin the whole thing around. It's quite professional. It's quite well organised. It's gone out the window, mate, because basically it's Max Hendry. He's not been in since Series 1. And um, I feel it's your chance to divulge any embarrassing stories you've got of Max and your general experience of him, mate. <laughs> you said this to me, literally, as we sat down. You said, we haven't got much news to talk about, so let's just sort of talk about Max Hendry's stories. And I said, well, where do I start? Where do I start? Um, many nicknames for our boy Max. One you just mentioned in the intro, which is, uh, well, the hashtag, that's so Max Hendry. And the other one was... Hashtag instability max, which was actually given but to him by me and Samir on a Belgium trip. Why is a that? Few years years ago, because he can't stand up in a boat, mate. <laughs> <laughs> he was all over the show. How he didn't end up in the Mars, mate, I do not know. Do not know. And he's had the nickname Instability Max since. Oh, God, there's so many stories Max has done of stupid shit, but I can't. He's he put m- me on the spot, mate. The first time I properly spent some time with him, right, was we did a live. And it was at the monument. We did it at Monument One. We were trying to do some maggot fishing bits. And he drove from Essex to the monument, fished for six hours, and like, I've got to get back to the factory, Hassan. And I was like, Max, you haven't slept in 26 hours. I think you need to sleep. And he was like, no, I'll do it. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean so, you'll do it? It's like a four-hour drive, Max. Sounds like Max, mate. Genuinely. Mental. But I love him. I love him. He's one of my good friends here at Nash and... Yeah, I, it wouldn't be the same without him, and he wouldn't be the same if he wasn't the way he was. Like I love him for who he is, and yeah. everyone else does. But yeah, he was given the nickname that's so Max Hendry because just the pure amount of stupid shit he's done over the years. Like, what's he done? What's he done to you personally? Because like, you must, I mean, he's under suppose he's bait side of things. But there's been times where you've been together on trips, filmed together. You must have worked on things together. With yeah, so the, the, most of the time I've spent with Max in a work scenario is shows and sort of filming out on the bank of things like that. But well, I think one of the, what I'd say wouldn't even call it a funny journey. Really. I basically, there's one show, there was a show in Mon Luzon. Yeah. Um, cart fish and show. I think it was every February, something like that. And I was in China the week before with Alan. And this is a good story. Actually, I was in China for a week with Alan and Alan was like, I know on the Friday, let's just fly to Paris and then drive to the Mon Sun show and do two day. Oh, brilliant idea, Alan. Yeah, I'll come with you. That'd be sounds amazing. Like brilliant. <laughs> so yeah, Friday afternoon at uh, Beijing airport, waiting to board a plane to Paris, landed in Paris, um, then got in a car and got driven five hours to the Mon Sun show by one of the French consultants. Absolutely. I felt hell, mate. Like, I can't sleep on planes. I hate planes. Yeah, didn't feel good. Got to the show. Did a night, like, got to the show for the afternoon. Went to bed that night. Couldn't sleep. Jet lagged to hell. Woke up the next day, did the show, packed down the Mon Luzon show. Right, let's drive six hours back to Calais. I was like, I'll come with you, Max. Like, you're fresh as a daisy. I haven't slept. Mm. I'm going to be wingman. I'll just sit in the front, smoke fags and fall asleep. Like, yeah. And he was like, yeah, yeah, all right then, sweet. I'll come with you. And we we sort of left the show a bit too late when we needed to get the last crossing of the night. I think it was like one o'clock in the morning, something like that. And the next one was at like 420 so Max is absolute. We've left first. There was three vans. I think it was me and Max in one, 
Tommy and Alfie in another, and then Jimmy and Ian, two of the guys that help us with the shows in the other one. So there's three vans, and we've left first, and we was like, right, we are getting to this crossing before all of them, because we do not want... I'm not getting on the train at four o'clock in the morning. I need to get home. I haven't been home in 10 days. I've yeah. got jet lag to hell. I just want my own bed, like... So Max is absolutely tanking it, flying through Paris, going, going, going. And where he's tanked it so hard, the engine started overheating. And literally, when the little... I rung Samir, because he's like into his cars and that, and he was like, you need to let some heat off the in- engine. So he was like, bang all the heaters on as high as you can to get the heat out of the engine. I was like, didn't think of that. Brilliant idea. So we've done that. Going through Paris, it started to drop a little bit, and then it's just started going up again. And we're like, we're, we're, it's going to blow up, mate. Like he's doing like on one ten in a crafter through, like on the oh, way to, to on the way to uh, Calais. So he's like, we're going to have to pull over, mate. So we've pulled over, just sort of gone and got some food, let the engine cool down for half hour, forty five minutes. In the meantime, the other two vans have obviously done us and overtaken us. We've got to Calais with them two lap vans getting there before us. They've got on the last train. We've scanned our credit card and it's gone like next available crossing 420. Epic uh, fail. Epic fail, mate. And I was like, Max, man, like we didn't need to be doing one. Uh, at the time, I was like, yeah, one ten, faster, man, faster, faster. Just get us home, get us home. And then when we got there, it's, oh, Max, it's your fault. Like, but How did he take that? Was he all right? He was all right, mate. I was nearly in tears because all I wanted to do was go to sleep in my own bed. And I actually remember the two lads, went, other vans, went onto the train. We then sat at sort of the barriers waiting for three hours for the next train. Oh. And I just got a bed chair out the back of the van, sort of, Moved a load of stuff around, laid a bed chair out and went to sleep for a couple of hours in the back of the van before we could eventually board. Surely there was a bit of spooning. No. 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 I thought he'd have held you because he's cost you. He smells a squid, mate. (laughs) (laughs) You're a squid boy. (laughs) Squid me. (laughs) um, Yeah, uh, there's so many stories about Max, man. But yeah, I love him to pieces. He's one of my good mates here and yeah. To go back to some semblance of professionalism and not just have a laugh, Max. <laughs> um, Nash Bate, mate, he's done a great job. Oh. Obviously, there's a lot going on, which we're not going to talk about because he's obviously going to talk about it in the podcast. But for you, since he came in there, he's oh, done he's a pretty mega done a job. Great it? job, mate. Great. He had big boots to fill, mm. obviously, from the likes of Basie. And I think what he's done is impeccable, mate. He's done an absolutely great job. He works ridiculously hard. Mad. And yeah, like you say, these new projects and the stuff we've got coming out that he's sort of been the main man behind it all. He can be very proud of himself, I think, because it's going to be awesome. It's classic Max Henry as well. Some of these like new items, there's one of them just sat in a vat outside your office, mate, when I walked in this morning. <laughs> it's just it's it's cause re- re- I took it out of the office. I brought it through. I've got like a little bit next to my office where I keep some of my fishing gear. And I was sorting a few bits out the other day and I took it out and put it for into the office and Reedy was like, get that out. It stunk the whole office out for hours and now I've just dumped it outside. Yeah, but top, man. Good stuff. Mikey, thanks for coming in doing the intro, mate. Thoroughly enjoyed it as ever. Uh, I'm going to go and get hashtag that so Max Hendry in the flesh on the sofa, mate. It should be an interesting podcast. It will be. Big love, mate. So, mate. Max Hendry, welcome to the podcast studio, mate. How are you? Very good, mate. Very it's good. Good to pin you down. How long since you did your last one? Blimey, it was when we were doing it in Kev's office. Like, it's got to be two years ago, surely. But Something the, like that. One of the first, isn't it? Series one, I think, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Like, it's definitely my first time in here. Is it? Yeah, I don't. I think I might have been shown round. Dan was very proud of his sounding like stoppage and all that stuff. So Fair play to Yeomans. He's done a good job in it. He did, yeah. He's got a nice paint job. Some soundproof business. A plant that's a real plant that needs water in that I've only just found out. So it's not been watered for 40 episodes, maybe more than 40 <laughs> episodes by this point. So probably need to take care of that. But other than that, a little upgrade for you. You're nice and comfy on the couch. You've got your, sock, your shoes off. Your sock, you'd be living the dream. Yeah, that's it. It's like the most horizontal I've been for a long while. I was going to say, yeah, it's been mad, hasn't it, recently? Mm. We're going to talk about sort of the developments, not only in in work context, but in sort of your personal life context. Mm-hmm. Um, but proceeding, or sort of shortly after you filmed the first one, and the year after that, we've gone through loads of changes. The company's expanded. We've had lockdown and that whole, we've had Brexit and that whole implication on sort of Nash Bait. Generally, now, Nash Bait, where would you say it is in terms of what your plan was? Bigger and better than you thought it was or or sort of not? I would say absolutely. 
but I'm very, very guilty as a person where I'm always thinking about the future of not really smelling the roses as they happen, if you know what I mean. So I need to take that breath sometimes and actually like dwell on what's been achieved or what's been done. Certainly two years ago, we didn't really know what was happening with the Brexit situation and what it implicate us on the bait side of things. But more importantly, we also didn't know a lot about this coronavirus that was going to be occurring and how much of an impact it made to everyone. And I think, to be honest with you, it's almost been a blur as a result, hasn't it? Because mm. there was months where we were either locked down or there was a lot of like holding us back, if you like. And we've only really started to be, I suppose, unleashed a bit more in the last month or two, really, would you say? Mm, yeah, you know? definitely. And things are coming back to normal. There's not so much, like even the silly things, you're wearing a mask in a supermarket you have to consciously think to pick up your mask in the van before you go in and go to a shop or you do anything in a public space. And that is starting to slowly ebb away and it's becoming a bit more sort of, it's becoming more pleasant really, Hassan. Yeah, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. It it was weird. There's a lot of gesturing, isn't there, in people's faces and you can't see that for a mask. Like when you talk and you interact with people, like that's something that's lost. You don't think of it at the time, but... When you're actually talking to a person and you can see their face, you can see the reaction. And I think now, like, I'm okay. I can, like, I'm, like, normal. Mm. But, like, there was an interim period, like, a few weeks back where we were out of lockdown wearing masks and people were moving about. And you'd see people that you hadn't seen maybe for, like, I don't know, five, six months. It's like, can I hug you? Mm. Can I shake your hand? Yeah. Do do we do this weird standoff thing where we like you know it was odd. I found it. Maybe that's just me. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but but hopefully, as you say, brighter brighter things are on the horizon. I wanted to start fishing wise. Now I know work is mental and mm. life is mental for you. But since your last podcast, yeah, I know you've been what is home for you, Lincolnshire way, mm-hmm. and done a bit of fishing on a certain complex, mate. Talk to me about about that so it's it's all so surreal because we'd miss out on because we've just been like locked away at home you think have I actually done much fishing and then you look (laughs) back at two years you think yeah I've done quite a bit but obviously it's just never been really I suppose never been talked about if you like so I think I've been I went basically I like to go up to uh, fish up at Girton I've got like an AJS group ticket, if you like. So they've got the availability of some of the lakes and we sponsor the guys at AJS. So it's always good to go up there and just go and see them really and mm. have a bit of a bit of a chat, chew the fat and see how they're all getting on and stuff like that. And they're a really good bunch of guys anyway. And it's near where my parents live. So it's kind of got a t- double-edged sword for saying hello. Double, my dad normally double. comes down and we have a bit of food or whatever in an evening. And yeah, it's just nice, you know. Um, normally because of my schedule, I don't really have the chance to fish springs very heavily and the summertime. So then the winter, as it starts to become in more sort of just rolling bait and getting stuff done, that's when I tend to find a bit more time. So I, I did, so it was, feels so long ago, probably a couple of years ago now, We I, went, I go to Girton and I fish either the November for a couple of nights or I fish the December for a couple of nights. And it's quite a deep lake. So I think it, there's a lot of 30 foot areas um, sort of surrounded and then bars and stuff like that that you can fish that are a bit shallower. Is it so, that deep? Yeah, it far? is, yeah. So oddly enough, I actually got a topography map from there when I've when you get all your pack and stuff, your membership, and I thought I'll just have a bit of a consideration of where I think they could be in December. Mm. And obviously everyone says like Deep Lakes fish longer. I fished Elstow um, probably nine, eight, nine years ago. So I sort of understood the whole they seem to fish really well to sort of December, maybe early January, depending on how mild or mm. horrible the weather was. So I sort of thought, well, I can probably catch them over bait in there and have a good chance. And there is quite a few carp in there now, you know. Um, but I went up there and um, I was fishing. I think there's like two bowls where they sort of live and you see them show all the time, but they're like 30 foot deep. Mm. But you could find there was a bar that sort of ran almost like where they were digging the aggregate. So there'll be a bar in the centre. And that, that central bar was although it was at long range, it was actually the perfect interception point if they got up in the water. The yeah. bar was still 19 foot deep, yeah. but like yeah. that was the area. And that's sort of hit back home really for when I did fish Elstow. It was very much, I fished on the pit two, which was very deep average, yeah. sort of 25 foot plus. And we, the lads and myself, we always did better towards the autumn time and into winter because they got down there. Like I think I caught my deepest carp I caught out of Elstow was 
38 foot, 40 foot, That's something deep, like that. Isn't it? So yeah, it was, it was, it's, I knew it was doable. It wasn't like a screw up in my head. It wasn't like really untrodden ground. So I sort of understood that. But luckily I found 19 foot. And that's, that's the thing mentally, isn't it? Mm. I remember going to a feature when I was at Carpology, um, those years uh, on Bundy's. Yeah. Mentally deep. That's even deeper than else. That's 55 foot in I don't places. Know, mate, but yeah. like, like I, I wasn't, I was, it was somebody else who was fishing there. So I just mm. went round, but just to cast a bare lead out and, and wait for it to drop was like, it was a complete mind screw. Do you know what I mean? If you hadn't done it and you're not used to it, it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, it's really hard in them lakes because they are deeper. Like often the water does, uh, sorry, the weed and stuff doesn't grow up so well on the bottom. So you end up with spots that you, you would cast a lead out and 30 foot everywhere and get a, like a really decent drop. Mm. You think, oh, I'm fishing, but it's not where they want to be. Like you have to find the areas and it made it even harder there because it was a clay pit. So like, Everyone looks for clay spots, don't they? Because they're really good and the whole lake was clay. So you'd have to find like hard shale. Like there would be like areas where it like scraped or whether they'd, where the fish had fed and they'd like got down to this like sort of shale mix of clay and shale. And that always was the better spots I always found or right in all the oil grass and all that. So. Yeah. But like I say, you're always getting drops. So it's very tricky to discern which is the best spot to fish or what areas. And I know a few lads did really well spreading boilies and fishing naked choddies over the top, like just dead <laughs> simple fishing. They just got on them and did that, you know. But as autumn grew, went on, you could bait and you find them in these certain central areas in deep water and you could still catch them. But it has so many variables in deep water. Like it's not, yeah. it's not even as easy as you put, you find a 12 foot spot, a 10 foot spot, put your bait out over three rods. It's going to hit the bottom in a half decent spread. When you're putting it out in 30, you've got to be thinking of what bait you use because it's got to descend fast through a toe. So for you, what was it? Bigger particles, bigger items, yeah, heavier definitely. items? Yeah, it was, um, oh, it would have been just boilies and half boilies, to be honest, because yeah. it's just what you know you can get down fast. Um, if I found a still day, I'd bait with bits on a still day just because then I knew that, say, for instance, if it did get down to the bottom and it was it was there, there was something there for, for longer. So mm. I could sort of hold fish. Um, but certainly it would always have a big, you'd have to be looking at intervals of weather in order to make sure your bait got down, which is quite different to what normally it just matters what the wind's doing. You just wang out there and you know, yeah. don't you? But yeah. but it does have a huge effect, you know. And I think, my, like undertoes and stuff would do my head on with like, like if you're fishing like flake, for instance, or like park yeah. school, I'd be like, it might be all right for the first six foot, but it might just, I, it would do my head, I think. That. Yeah, I think it's always a, you have to be drum tight because then if you are perfect on, on the same branch on that tree relentlessly, then that spread will be more sort of consistent. So you'll mm. bait a larger area because of the toe, but it will always be in that area. Whereas if you're like right, left, here about, <laughs> like it's a problem straight away. It's probably why I'm a goner. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. But this this lake in question at Girton, that was exactly the same, you know, 19 foot and one on the, on the still days got more bites because I could bait tighter and the toe was there and I could have picked my right intervals so I did actually I found as well that when it was sunny they'd get up on the bar in 19 foot and they'd enjoy the sun in that sort of depth and it was warm enough there for them to still be feeding heavily and I well I actually caught I caught three on the drop so I cast out a, a rig and it hadn't hit the bottom and it was like off like that, and I was playing one on that, the drop yeah I think I had like 17 or 18 carp in a couple of nights there oh, go on, boy. which was great but there, there were. There's a lot of stockies in yeah. there as they're building it up and they're feeding them and they're growing. I think um, I talked to Anthony last week and he said that they're starting to get thirty pound stockies already. Yeah. So it's going to be a super water in like oh, the, in the next few years. It'll be incredible. You said it before. The team of lads there. You've got Ben Emptage. You've got Drew. You've got Anthony Sylvester. You've got Ollie. You've got all the like. If you want anybody to run your fishery, yeah. they are the boys. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's a mega place. So it's got potential already, you know, um, and I'm just trying to sort of piggyback that early before everyone realises. You can on <laughs> You know, but there's obviously there is the sort of big three. You've got a £55 common, a £60 common, and another sort of £50 mirror in that bracket. And I did actually see Butthead, which is the biggest one. It was showing behind me. And I have to. I think I had to fish. It was quite a long way, to be honest. One hundred percent butthead. Yeah, like you can't mistake a sixty pound common showing, no, like okay. even at like one hundred and forty yards. But it was it was right behind the spot, and I was fishing sort of probably three length rod lengths behind him. But I just I, it was almost strange. It's almost like I could it was like a void, like this glass partition that wouldn't let. I should have I could have fished longer, but 
when an area is bars like that and you're cast into bars and you've got gravel and then deeps either side, mm. there's that worry that you're going to get cut off. So I was fishing 20 pound line, like having to blast it as hard as I could to get it out there. Small work baits and all that sort of thing. So in an ideal world, yeah, I would have fished right on top of his head, <laughs> like right out there. But Chucked a choddy right on his head. Yeah. Finger. But um, yeah, like I say, really enjoyable fishing, you know, and uh, definitely something that I try and I'll try and do is like pick that first week in November that around, well, Terry Ern always says it, doesn't he? That first week and first and second week in November is always worth being on the bank for. And um, that's also around the same time as my birthday. So I kind of try and treat myself to a couple of nights, you know? So yeah, I don't think I'm ever going to do enough nights that I'll actually be close to catching that. But that felt very close in that instance because it was there, you know? So if you're seeing it, mate, yeah, you are close. You never know though, do you? It can just happen, can't it? Yeah, that's it. You got, you can get lucky sometimes, you know? So. I hope you do, man. Yeah. You've got a thing with big commons, though. Man. Remember the box? You've had the box, haven't you? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that was luck as well. That <laughs> like, I was just spotting out at St. John's. Could have been one in 900 bite, and it was a box common. All you so, need, one bite. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Still in his sling in the boot, isn't it? Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, it's in Nash's Lake. Actually, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and in terms of other fishing episodes, we're going to talk about work and exactly what's going on. But... I think it was early, was it earlier this year? Or was it late last year? You caught a real good one from church, didn't you? you yeah. Little... So in between that time, because again, it's all sort of moulded into what. And last year, I actually did a couple of nights on there. Kev let me have a couple of nights fishing on there way before this one, and I caught two mid forties in a session. 40s. Yeah. So that was crazy. He was again, just fishing close in and little traps as as I sort of do with real slack lines. And I think it was a lot of zig fishing at the time. The lads were. Trying to do that sort of thing. What time of year is this? Max? Oh, blimey. Um, that would have been, I think it was late April, May. Okay. I can't remember whether we was, oh, we was out of lockdown. I know that much because it was, it was just before they started opening up the fishing for the proper, right. uh, for the anglers again, if you know what I mean. And I okay. managed to just slot in. I think it was probably for a weekend because they normally close it on a weekend, isn't mm. it? So, yeah, um. Yeah, so I basically fished up there and just fished in like on the edges, but on the shelf sort of thing, and yeah, managed to catch two real nice ones. So, talk to me about your little trap setup. What oh, it's just it? oh, it's just you must little... do something obscure. It won't just be normal. No, I just fished it like weird in there. I just see um, there's a lot of I just fish like real slack fluorocarbon and just find the edge of the weeds like where the where the weeds starting to pick up the naturals because they come up the shelf, don't they? Yeah, depending on the heat, but they obviously as it's warming. They come further and further up, so I was just trying to find the edge, like the seam, a natural, and sort of place my baits as close to that as I could. And um, I managed to just find this sort of edge where the silt weed sort of bunched up, and I put a rig there, and that sort of did me three bites. I think I had a 29 fully scaled, which was a real nice one, and then one called the Two-Tone Lin, I think Tom's caught before as well, and... Um, the baby face common, which is just oh, a yeah. big forty pound common. So yeah, battered it then, yeah. really, mate. Yeah, I've been really lucky. I fished it twice, um, and I've had three forty pounders and a twenty nine. So that's a good average, isn't it? You know, Mike drop done. Yeah. What bait rig? Talk to me. Just, There's been something weird in here, Max. I'm not having that. You've just <laughs> gone there, found a spot legitimately like anybody else could find, fished it and caught them. There's be something obscure left field. Uh, not. Is is well, well widely publicised. I put a lot of rock salt in. Like I basically put rock salt and sweet corn and crush boil it in, and I fish like a half bait or a meshed like bit of paste of parboiled. So then it's just like leaking attraction, but it looks like a bit, you know, like a piece on the bottom. And um, yeah, just put that in the edge. So um, Max Hendry. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's, I'm just used to doing that sort of thing, you know. But at the same time, uh, maybe fishing a round boily or a bright yellow one might not be the one you know always mm. you know so I think yeah. um, sometimes trying to just make it look like there's just a bit of bait that someone's scattered or thrown about <laughs> it's sort of less less cautioned isn't it and yeah. they do get pressured now yeah yeah they're, they're fished for every week solid you know so and certainly in the spring they're very mobile but they're also quite tricky to catch I remember the first night that I did there was I thought I wasn't going to catch one because all I was getting was just savage liners all the time but nothing was actually happening and you had to had to actually end up putting quite big back leads on and with fluorocarbon and then fishing bow string lines. So it was like a tr- like a snar- like a snare. snare you yeah, know? yeah. So then whenever I got a bite, it just the rod just bounced straight, like <laughs> right, and then the bobbin would drop off and then obviously you'd get a take. But they were so shocked by it, it sort of it's different, it helped, it? yeah, quite a lot. So and something that I've done a bit in recent times because 
like I say, it's like this cold spring. There's that whole, yeah. as soon as, even if they shake a lead off or, or whatever they do, like they shake their head, there's straight away that tension from another perspective that they might not be used to. So, yeah. I like that. As you say, it's springtime. I've been out there this year, like early spring, and they've definitely been moving. But in terms of feeding, yeah, they certainly haven't been. Like no. it's been one of those where, and Zig's a band obviously on there, but you would have a chance maybe on a Zig, but yeah. they are, you go anywhere there and the water's that clear. You can see them just circling around, doing laps and moving quite quickly to be fair. Yeah. Like waking up, cleaning off, loads of shows. But in terms of what the anglers up there were catching, yeah, it was obviously not in accordance to what you saw in front of you. You think they've got to drop down using all that energy. But as you say, like it, on there, less is more and it's sort of the finer, the yeah. finer adjustments you make there, the difference, isn't they? Yeah, I think um, also I'd, Obviously, I've done sort of two springs, late springs on it, I suppose, with just a couple of nights. But there's one thing that I've clearly noticed is that there's obviously got the Wibble Bank, which is like the sort of river bank. They get there first and they are catchable there first on the bottom over anywhere else. And it is from about April to May, mid-May. It just seems to, for some reason, I've got it in my head that if I'm fishing in that interval there always has to be a rod there because you will get a bite off of a, off of a decent sized carp from that zone. Mm. It just seems, I don't know what it is. It might be the sun, to be honest, the sun comes up and hits that bank, sort of tracks it. And the area to the right of the lodge is yeah. quite sunny anyway, but they've got an area that they transit out of that. They don't, they tend to sort of hold up in the corner, but they don't feed that well. But there is a couple of very small spots that are on that wibble bank that they do pass and they will drop down and feed on and, that's how you nick them. You you can't put a lot of bait out. It's like a palmful. Yeah. Like in them. Trap. And obviously the bait and pole came out. Oh, and the was, following was year. Yeah. So well, so that was the first year it was a it was a cast and lots of lead work and yeah. finally like dialed it in. But the second year, so this spring, I suppose it would have been. Yeah. Um, it was just before the birth of my son, and I basically said to Kev, before I'm locked away doing <laughs> doing that sort of thing for a bit. Um which I want to do. I wanted to embrace it as being a father and stuff. I wanted to still just have that last, like, nice chilled out weekend before everything started to become so manic, you know, um, which he obliged. So that was great. And um, oh. it was day fishing only at the time. Oh, so, yeah, of course Yeah, it was. so I had to fish the days. So I'd come, I turned up on, like, on the Saturday morning, but I'd, and then obviously on the Sunday morning and fished for the whole day till dark and then left. So on each occasion... I was like prepping, but also waiting to see whether I could make an opportunity of something. And luckily I got a bit of sun during the day, which really warmed up them layers. And I caught from exactly the same spot that I just, that I caught the forties off, but another 40 pounder. And it was a one, I think it's a male fish, but um, my son's been named James and Nashi called it James's fish. So it's quite cool, you know, and I don't know whether that fish had been 40 pound before. I, I might be corrected. Tom and the guys, they know much more about it than myself, but, um, yeah, certainly it's it's a real cool carp and uh, yeah, quite quite. I was glad that it wasn't like one that I wasn't quite keen on. It was actually a really nice carp, so I'm glad he got named that one, you know. It's an absolute month. There <laughs> yeah. ain't really any in there. No, there, there isn't. No. So, that's it. so you're all right. But yeah. that's the result because, yeah, I mean, it hadn't really been fished because of lockdown. You've come out of it and yeah, to get a bite on there, days only. Ooh, yeah, that's some good going. Uh, in terms of other fishing, obviously work, has been busy so your mm. fishing time's limited um you have though got a trip planned somewhere pretty special haven't you yes yeah so um uh, one of my good friends jim wilson he um he actually said there was a slot coming up for, for him like and there's someone else to fish on spitfire pool in norfolk which yeah obviously it's very well revered it's a very special lake and the carp in there they are just astounding you know mm. and um i did a week last year and, oh, you um, did a week last year on it, did you? Yeah, I did, yeah. And um, that. yeah, that was a bit of a, uh, it, it wrecked my head. Like, there's no doubt about it because there's a lot of school of thought that the lads say, like, leave just a rig there and they will find it and mm. you will have a chance. At some point in that week, they will find your rig and if it's presented, you will catch one. So a lot of guys fish the hinge stiff rig and they, they fish like boilies or light scattering of boilies and it's big carp tactics, you know, and you're just hoping for that spark that planets to align and catch one of the the special carp and i think to be honest with you on there it doesn't matter what you get a bite from <laughs> like it's just such a spe- spectacular place to fish and it is 
it is granite. Like I, <laughs> yeah. I can't, yeah. I did the first week, there was a period where I'd see the long common, which yeah. I, I think at the time, I think it's three or four years, it hasn't been caught. And I know why. It's because he would swim through the reeds and smash him with his tail and then come back round in a circle and eat all the snails off the reeds. Oh. And he'd do that relentlessly all week. So you'd see him, which is actually torture because you've got possibly a 50 pound common that hasn't been caught for four years. Having a right load of fun only could be feet from where your rigs are placed. And I've got other plans of attack for this year, as you do, you learn and then you go back. But certainly that year, I, I, ch- I spent some time chasing. Jim's a bit more clever than me because he's fished it a bit, but he's yeah. fished it like a week extra. So he's like, I'm staying put. <laughs> I know what I'm going to do. Yeah. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I've still stuck to my guns. Whereas I thought I'll do a bit more chasing. <laughs> so I found the long common in the back bay. Um, right near a sort of willow tree and some weed and I would be I basically managed to when he left during the day to go up into the sort of main body I raked a spot and like close to where he was got it all perfect and then went to fish and I had to go home midway through the week but I needed to be back I ended up going back coming back that night very late and I was like I'm going to get up at first light so I got up at three o'clock and I walked down there and rather than him being in the place that he shouldn't have, like that he shouldn't have been, he was right over where right. I'd raked, and I couldn't, I couldn't get a rig in without knowing that I'd spook him. And also added to that, you watch him spending a lot of time with his top load of his tail out of the water, so he's flat, isn't he? Yeah. On that occasion, in the ten to twenty minute period, I could see the bottom half of his tail, so he was feeding, wasn't he? No. So. I was like, there's a 10 minute period where I almost certainly had him on the spot. You'd have got a bite there, mate. So in order to get a rig out there as best I possibly could, I ended up moulding a ball of putty around a helicopter bead, (laughs) like a helicopter rig. So I made like a half ounce lead and sharpened my hook (laughs) in the hope that even if it snagged in a bit of weed or something, it would still have some purchase so it would pull the hook in. And then I just watched the line. And I basically like quiver tip for him. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I basically sat there watching and like managed to get the rig in without spooking him. So he did like a little turn, little chew, and then sort of ended up in this weed and his head was sort of in the weed. So I got the rig in, didn't spook, and he came back round and I got him down on the spot without him feet, like without him spooking. Obviously thought, this is it, game on. Yeah, it's happening. He did the off like 10 minutes later, so this is what I mean by there was like a 10 minute window of where I had a chance of even having a bite. And that was all week. That was a 10 minutes in a week. And then he was gone for the whole time, straight up the other end, plowing through the reeds, smashing snails and eating them. And I never had him come back to that zone for the rest of the time. And the main body of the lake proved really hard. Jim had put baits out in the sort of margin traps. And one morning or one evening, actually, we were sat there talking. We saw like a common, I don't know whether it was the big commons, they showed all of a rod length out. One of them just went whack straight out of the water. And I'm thinking, how? Like, it's so close. Like, it's so on top and it feels so, the atmosphere feels so pressurized, mm. you know, like you just, yeah, you, you, don't, you feel really exhilarated as you do it, but it really does wreck your head because you can see them, you know. And um, we're unfortunate to a degree. Um, but not, obviously. Jason Yaxley, one of the guys that's fishing there, he had the wood common just a week before. Amazing. Like, Ooh. credit to him. It's an incredible carp, you know? Um, but that meant that it was almost... I almost felt like the long common was the only perceivable target, even mm-hmm. though it hadn't been caught for four years. But it, I am told now that the wood does come out sort of quite often one week and then a following week. So maybe I, maybe we could have had a chance with it, you know? But, um, yeah, I'm going back next month for a week, so... Hopefully, I can get even. Mate, what if either of those two incredible, yeah, like, incredible comments? It's sort of funny, really, because I haven't done a lot of fishing this year, but I certainly wouldn't gram- grumble at one of them and a forty pounder from the church for a season. Good average, <laughs> like, boy. Yeah, and that's it. Like, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not worried, and I've sort of seen it. Like, well, I've done a lot of hard work. I've obviously had my son, and it's been amazing being with him for the last sort of five months. But it would be really nice to have that little, that little bit of. Uh, sort of a win on the on the fishing side just for this year, you know, it's tied me over. So I'll wait avidly looking yeah. at my WhatsApp group, mate, to see a yeah. picture of you with that. I hope it happens for you. You deserve it, mate. Especially because of work. Now mm-hmm. work, I'm gonna give you one word to describe what work's been like, sort of over the last year. 
maybe year and a half? What's it been like, mate? Insane. <laughs> you can't. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm really passionate about my job and I love what I do and I want to do better and improve Nash Bait, whether it be the products or the way we do business. But ultimately, it takes a lot to do what you have to do, you know, to make it a success. You know, it's a competitive world we live in. So, yeah, I'm having to uh, sort of, yeah, compete, if you like. And uh, as a result, yeah, it is it is mad. You're straight up mental, mate. I'm going to tell the people that I came... When did I start? November? I think November last year I came for a um, an induction tour, which, as you can imagine at Nash, is, is thoroughly extensive. <laughs> um, I went down to Burnham, signed some contracts and paperwork, and then they took me on a... Uh, I'm going to say you took me on a tour of the bait factory. My God, Hendry. I don't know how many eggs you were talking about. You talked loads <laughs> of stats at me, but you were like, yeah. I've got this bit of uh, trim put on this machine. That saves me 0.2 of a percent. <laughs> I've got this little outflow here. That saves me another 0.2 of a percent. It was absolute mind-boggling science, numbers <laughs> and balance sheets in the bait factory, which was just churning out 24-7 bait, let alone the ingredient store and all the sort of chemical, not chemicals, but all the ingredients that go into the bait. That baffled me. And then you took me to what was a massive husk of a huge industrial sized factory. You were like, yeah, and we're going to have a factory in here and I've got some bespoke machinery uh, and I've had to get all the councils to sort of sign off on all the stuff. I was like, how'd you deal with that? That's mental. <laughs> you learn fast. <laughs> yeah, but you you come from an editorial background. Yeah, I used to take photographs and write for magazine or well, I used to run uh, Advanced Cart magazine, but yeah, now, yeah, very much the opposite. But I am, I'm a geek at heart and I like, <laughs> I like the engineering side, it interests me and I can understand where what stuff has an effect if I do certain things as in I do this and it makes me, it saves this much waste or, you know, that's kind of where I get my kicks from, maybe sadly these days, but yeah, that that's how I do it, you know. kicks from. Yeah, but it's never, it's never like sort of going to stop because I'm going to want to make the factory faster. I'm going to want to make more boilies. I'm going to want to be able to dry them quicker and get them in a bag faster so they can get fulfilled by the warehouse. I'm going to want to <laughs> make better of the waste that we do glean, so the any organic waste and stuff like that. I want to be able to look after that or treat that in such a way that we could either help or better the environment or our environmental impact as a company, packaging, branding, New product development. <laughs> These are things that baffle my head. Yeah, so, Andrew, I I just get a bag, put a boilie on the end or a pot if it's a pop up or a yeah. wafter, and whack it out. But the consideration that I had, and this is me being genuinely honest, <laughs> uh, in terms of the whole process of bait making, the the sort of inc- like the quantities involved in just what's produced and the demand for it, yeah, honestly, did my absolute yeah. swede. I was like, no way. Yeah, I think um, to a degree, like some some people go like, oh, boilers have just appeared, don't they? They're just easy, like, because they are so convenient. They've been made convenient. Yeah. But anyone that's made their own bait to make a kilo or make a six egg mix, it's like, it's a lot, it can be a lot of work if you're hand rolling it. Now, obviously we have machinery to do that, mm. but it's still got to be done. And when you bear in mind in Scopex Squid alone, we make our own scopex. We make our own red liver oil. We make our own sweeteners, etc. Some like just before that's before you even put a base mix in. Mm. They've got micro ingredients. There might be fifty of them. So like just to make scopex squid boilies, there might be four hundred both micro ingredients and large bulk ingredients that make that product. So I've got to source them from all over Europe, etc., and get them all into one place so that we can make a boilie. And that's just scope X quid. So how many range? We have oh, 300 mate, lines in the range. Yeah, it's loads, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. So how do you think that works? That's and then mad, you've got it? to consider like flake. You've got to consider like hook baits, which are completely different. Yeah. That's very yeah. long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So I don't understand how your brain can compute that and then start to think about how you can make that process quicker, more efficient, better for the consumer and better for the company. Where does that come from, Max? What have you read? What have you done? Um, I don't know. I just, uh, I've got quite a um, habit of 
I, I do ask a lot of questions and I'll often say to people that are more of a sort of um, expertise in certain areas, I might ask you stupid questions, but if you just answer them for me to be, even if it's just being polite, then I can sort of gauge where I'm at with it and then I can understand it faster, you know, and I like to think that that's what, that's what I try and I'm good at is I'm learn I learn very fast. So I've probably been working in the bait factory for two years now mm. and Basically, I was doing the sort of brand management side of things, but That's it was right. more media and stuff like that. And Gary was sort of winding down and they needed this person to be, I suppose, manage the site and sort of take it take it on and grab it with both hands. And Alan obviously had a chat with me about it and he said, look, it's a really good, good opportunity for you. We know you're capable, but you will be throwing it in at the deep end. And the kind of... I'm quite a calm person. I don't mm. tend to get very irate and wound up. I st- stick to my sort of, I, I understand that things will get done and I will do them to the best of my ability, but it's not ever something that I worry about. I just, I'm almost completely desensitized to any fear of any failure or anything like that. That doesn't. How? how? I don't know. Just maybe it's. First thing I'd think is I'm following in Gary Bay's. It's yeah. Nash Bay. He's made it. I'm going to drop it and I'm going to look like an absolute numpty and it'll be down to me because at the end of the day, I know that there are other people involved in the process, but the bottom line that's signed off is you, isn't it? Yeah. So I don't understand where you, where you blank, how you blank that out of your head. Um, probably because you don't, if you've got like a grand plan in your head and I've, I know where I want it to be in 10 years. So all these little things that are frustrating us and stuff, they're, they're just they're superfluous. They don't mean anything to me that because they to detract me from the main goal. Yeah, always. And so you think very much long term. Yeah. Well, you know, no short term goals. Yeah, like short term goals would be oh we've got a problem with export. Let's get that sorted. Yeah, that's a short term goal. I can I, we can do that. In the long term goal is your big vision at the end of it. Yeah, I wrote the I wrote <laughs> stupid, but I wrote the grand plan. Like I wrote myself the Nash Bay grand, grand plan. plan. Yeah, and I've basically gone right. I know what I need to do. So I know now what I need to do to hit it in this many years. And as long as Kev and Lee and Alan will have me and be part of their team in that role, then I will get it done. I'm pretty sure they will, mate. I'm not sure. Who else is going to deliver the grand plan? Mm-hmm. You've got one, which is always a good starting point. Yeah. Um, you are, a lot of the team are pretty, this sounds really bad if HR listen to this, um, pretty good at dealing with a lot of work in concentrated periods, not a lot of sleep. Combine that with a newborn, mm. how have you managed that? Um, I've got a very understanding partner, but I'm not going to say that I've spent the whole time sla- slept in the spare room whilst she toils away with a young child. Mm. I've every I've been up just as much as she has, changing nappies, feeding him at two o'clock in the morning, and I still come to work because I don't want my contact with him to be a detriment because I've got a busy job. So when I am at home, I am so focused on him for them periods as I possibly can be because I want to enjoy him growing up. Mm. And that's the way I see it. I want to be a family man, but I appreciate you got to wear money and that's through my job. So I've got to do the both and I've got to do the both very well. So when do you sleep, Max? Talk to me. How many hours? He sleeps well at the moment, but you're working a lot. Yeah, um, I can I can fully function well on four hours sleep. You <laughs> got it. There it is. Yeah, Here's the, I remember the first time I met you. I think I've said this <laughs> before on a podcast. Um, you were um, we were at Monument. Yeah, went to Monument One, and we did a, a yeah, we did in the winter in yeah. the winter maggot fishing, yeah. and you drove there, and we fished till like midnight. Yeah, from like. We got there like first light till midnight, and then you went. Oh, I'm going. But I've got to go back to the factory to do some work. <laughs> you drove at midnight yeah. down, down to Essex to the factory to do some work. Yeah, yeah, I did actually. Yeah, I mean, I think I grabbed a couple of hours on the bed chair and then saw the night shift off, and then that was it. But yeah, it was, needs must. You bonkers, mate. Yeah, 
maybe it's like a addictive personality thing, you know, like yep. I'm very driven in whatever I do. So if it is fishing, my job would probably suffer if my fishing was really on point. Yeah. Because I can't do all in. Yeah. It's just, that's it. But I have had to be a bit more lenient with it since having, having a young and because it's, it's very, very important to me, you know? So yeah, I don't, I don't ever want to miss out if I can help it. You know? mm. so, you're basically Nash's or Nash Bates' very own mad scientist, mate, ain't you? Yeah. I'd like to think so. I'd like to do more with the more sciencey stuff, the development stuff. Gary still has quite a, yeah. a sort of hold on, not hold, that's not the right way to say it. He has a lot of um, influence on because of his knowledge base. Yeah. But I also come to him with lots of ideas on the floor to sort of figure out what we can do, you know, and um, improve it and... I certainly use, in the first, obviously the first year or so that Gary was there, it was like every day, like give him a ring and ask him what's going on, even if he's not in the factory. But certainly as it's got further and further on, he's not, not that he's not needed. I just don't bother him because he's got a busy fishery fishery business and I can normally deal with everything barring a couple of things, which I feel he gets the most passion out of. He still really is interested in developing bait and, making new products so i'm going to use him to the advantage of that as opposed to going oh gary like i've got a problem with the extraction like what do you recommend with this or i need to write to the council no nah, just that's not going to be I a bit of gary is it no, right into the it. council yeah he hate he hated he said the worst thing about it as it's sort of built and built is that we become very stringently monitored by the local councils and etc quite rightly because we've got an environmental um sort of I suppose requirement as a as a business, but he said that the office time was the worst killer for him in like in his job, and he would much rather be lab guy, you know, like just working on stuff. So what would I do? I'd use him to his advantage, you know. Yeah, where, he's, where I'm going to get the best of him, you know. So what I was it like of, going into that, like working with him, the relationship with him uh, over time? Because he's like I had him in for a podcast. I've only before that only spoke to him sort of fleetingly, mm. but I had him down. I thought he's like yourself, really, like a complete one off. Like, I, I, don't, well, I wouldn't know how to describe him. Like, nature man meets Mr. Sort of nonchalant, meets somebody who's very sort of charismatic and passionate, all in one. It's very hard to pigeonhole him. Mm. But, like, I just found him a fascinating bloke to work with him. I really didn't know what that would be like in a context of you coming from mm. a different background into that world. What was that like? He's like me. He's like not really, he doesn't get stressed with anything. Mm. He actually does more. He gets stressed with things more now because um, he's got, because he's probably got more time to think about stuff. So sometimes he comes to me with the most inane thing that he wants to, that we should 100 million percent change in the factory and I'm like, Gary, it's really not a, not a problem. <laughs> not that deep, Gary. Yeah, just honestly, it's really like low on the list right now. But he he means well because he just wants it to do well. And he's always on the phone if you need him for that, like that sounding board or that feeling. Or certainly, um, yeah, as it's gone through, especially with the legislation stuff and that we've had to do for export, like that has been a huge, mm. huge thing, you know. Talk to me about that. Brexit, getting bait over to Europe, the whole sort of debacle that was that because at one point when things were sort of opened and the constraints were put on around people taking bait out it was a nightmare it was like crisis gate people are smuggling boilies in like their luggage and yeah. stuff like that yeah I think um, it's sort of obviously we have a large volume of retailers that we have to supply abroad mm. and tackle wasn't an issue like that just went straight through you know but because we're dealing with animal byproducts or products of animal origin we've got to ultimately make sure that that's accountable traceable if you like so you can't operate your business in europe as a fishing bait company unless you have all of your ingredients well sort of registered if you know what i mean they know where they've come from you can buy a fish meal from many many different people but you need the fish meal that is from has a proper sort of listing it's registered there's Certified, bill yeah. of laden from that company to you so you could trace it back all the way back to the place um 
certainly we went one step further and we've got the grid reference where the actual fish was caught out in the sea to make the fish meal. And then obviously on top of that, what species of fish makes up the fish meal. You've got the um, grid reference the fish was <laughs> caught out in the sea. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's literally like a longitude and latitude like on our certificate Yeah, for it, which is I'm crazy. I'm down Cornwall next week. Shout me out some latitude. <laughs> yeah. mate, see if I can catch it. <laughs> yeah, where the good spots are, yeah. <laughs> There's a gravel bar at 6,000 wraps. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's sort of, I think it did actually f- f- like find down the playing field really for companies as well. Like there's a lot that it was very easy, Hassan, to send it over there. Like it used to be very, very easy. Yeah. But, um, and there's still to a degree there is when you're sending small parcels, but we're not going to be able to sustain our business on small parcels with like a large shipping company like DHL or something like that. That isn't going to happen. It's not going to work. Mm. We've got to look to be sending lorries. And when you've got a lorry full of fishing bait with products of animal origin in their contents, they're not going to just wave it through, are they? They're going to check on it. So you've got to be tidy. So there was a lot of worry. Uh, There's various sort of groups in angling all trying to band together to help sort of solve this issue if you like we worked with a consultant um and i did a lot of work myself i think one day i, I think i read the eu journal of export and it's supporting documents which is about a thousand pages of just jargon that i had to decipher with a pen I felt honestly, like i was sleep yeah already. Oh, no, no, honestly yeah it, it would nearly it was luckily it was just before my son was born so i had this little bit of time where i was like I can concentrate on this, but this must be done before he is born. <laughs> Full stop. Like there was no negotiation. I'm going to crack it before then. So he was born on the 22nd of March. So by then I had had my first lorry through. Oh, done. Done. Complete yeah. run. Yeah. With vet sign off and everything. Oh, nice. And since then we have been sending bait to yeah. Europe. So that's positive, you know, I believe, well, I don't see any reason why we won't continue to be that in that case. And yeah, I'm happy that by both the consultants and myself and my team at Nash Bay that we actually got the job done. So mm. because what would that, that would have Poor. imagine if that had stopped overnight, you know, as um, obviously I'd imagine if I, if we had got into a real situation, we would have looked to maybe get it rolled abroad. Yeah. You don't really want to be, but I like the fact that we make our own product yeah, and we source the ingredients ourselves, and they are rolled in house yeah, and packaged by our team and sent. So uh, by hook or by crook, I was going to try and keep that. Good pun. But yeah. It's Good a pun. pun. <laughs> you so, did, yeah. mate, you did a great job. I can imagine that being a very, very, very stressful time. Because if you take yeah. out Europe... Like everybody who is in England and maybe had never been to Europe before in terms of the whole angling sea, you think the UK is big. Mm. You go out there and you just realise it's a drop in the Yoda's Waller yeah. or something like that. You yeah. realise it's a drop in the ocean over here. Yeah. I mean, all of Europe loves the UK scene, like, but... If it's not yeah. available, what are they going to do? Exactly. That's the thing. Yeah. Where are they going to go, what they're going to do, and you don't want that. Yeah. But yeah, you've done a good job. So for you now, as of as of we speak... Laurie's going across with Nash Bait for filling orders. Yeah, like three a week. Three, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good, you know. And I've actually wrote a process of how we do it as how we export for the benefit of my guys, oh, well, Rad, who works in the sort of export side of things, so he can deal with it now. So it's not on my plate every day to make sure them lorries mm. go out. My Like, Rad does that for us, and that's amazing, you know. So um, that sort of is the main thing is, like, you can get people to solve these things, but you can't put that on their plate Yeah. as well. We've got to try and show someone that can cope with the process and make sure they're diligent with it. And by having that person that's solely for that, then that's perfect, you know? And for a, from a, and a sort of an angler going abroad perspective, because things are opening up. We talked about it at the very start. Of this is getting a bit more normalized. Travel is there. Yeah. Um, that means that essentially they can, get bait at a retail venue that you know out in wherever they're fishing france belgium yeah. wherever but you know that that is the same scopex squid or whatever bait it yeah. may be that is rolled in the uk that we use at home or whatever absolutely yeah and i think um all the guy anyone that was going to france and had a concern mm. i think an email to info on our nash tackle page and someone would be able to get back to them with at least a retailer in the local area or that area that maybe they could contact and pre-book yeah. so that we could get the bait down to them. And obviously they would 
go through a retail sector sort of thing for their boilies for France. So they're not having to do anything untoward to get it through. I have heard of lots of instances where people have got bait through willingly, no problem at all. But I wouldn't want to advocate no. being the person to go, yeah, it's brilliant. Send 200 kilo out in your van, mate, and just yeah, just wing it, you know, because it's gonna not going to work. That is against the law, technically. Yeah, I think there's a lot of conjecture in it. There's um, there's several bits of like, legislation I've looked at that say that it kind of you w- it wouldn't cause an issue, but at the same time, Change like chance that you could. The thing is, this is people is personal opinion. You might have someone at the border that's yeah. going to check it in a different way to someone that really doesn't care yeah. and he just waves you through, and you only have to find that one job's worth. <laughs> And then you end up losing all your bait for a French trip. So, well, not only that, potentially, depending on who that job's worth was or whatever, it could blow up in in the whole angling fraternity, really, couldn't it, mate? And they yeah. could put the brakes on everything and you definitely, definitely, definitely don't want that. No, that's it. I think, um, yeah, it's sort of your the, the needs of the person smuggling it over there, if you like. The smugglers? <laughs> yeah, the, the smugglers might they put it to a detriment of the companies but one thing i would say is that there is obviously we've done a lot of work we've got a registered feed business abroad if that legislation was or if it was to be questioned and you're showing them that legislation on our bag as being look we're registered Mm. we've got full eu compliance that might help but again I don't know what they're going to say. And yeah. I wouldn't want to say like 100%, don't worry about it, guys, because I don't want to ruin anyone's holiday. But I know a way of making sure their holiday is safe, and that is by finding a retailer in France and buying Scova Squid or whatever you want to buy Yeah, from there. Nice. A big one, and I, I sort of hinted at it before, was this crazy secondary, maybe even third... Dairy, if that's even a word. I think I've lost my train of thought completely. <laughs> tertiary, um, Factory, tertiary. Good from you, mate. <laughs> that's why you're here. Um, factory. Yeah. Like, not only have you got Brexit. Yeah. We've got the birth of your lovely boy that we're going to talk about. Yeah. But you've then got whatever you showed me with bespoke made machinery that had a humorous name because of some incident on a phone call or something with somebody who ordered it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or And and then maybe even a third factory. So there's a, there's a lot going on. Talk to me about all that. Why yeah. is there more factories, Max? So Nash baits grow in every year and we need to supply our bait. So with, in the case of certainly the Boily factory, that's not finished, as in that will continue to continually be developed. Mm. I've already seen from the data that I get and the sort of key performance indicators that I've set up and the guys report to me in the main factory. It's gone full nerd. There, nerd yeah, yeah, I have, mate. Yeah. So like I know where there's holes. I know that we are, say for instance, we can make a lot of boilies, but we can't pack them fast enough. Okay. I also know that I can not turn around the drying process as quick as I would have liked, but I think I've worked out a way of doing it on the same day. So I'll be able to boil, cook dry pack on the same day that obviously would need automation of machinery to do that and that is like the that would be the pinnacle of us making boilies in the uk you know because we could supply all hopefully (laughs) i say big hopefully it depends on the demand but we would i would like to think we could supply a lot much larger volume consistently okay but there's basically gains to be made absolutely yeah, we're we're behind. Like we always seem to just either be breaking even or chasing our tail. Right. And I don't want that, Hassan. I want to make sure that everything's back on tidy, you know? Yeah. yeah. Because you don't know what your growth's gonna always be every year. And what if my capacity is for another twenty percent, but actually we grow thirty percent? Mm. I've already got a disparity. So I've got to look at that and try and future proof us as a company and that is the way to do it is to improve the outfit of the process. Okay. So, so that's, why that's the plan. you could do that within that factory. Yeah. Why is there potentially two other factories here, mate? What's kicking <laughs> off? So I've got a second factory is a whole different product. There's a process. Um, is that the bespoke machinery? Yes, it is. Yeah. So Tell the story about the name of the machinery. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So 
Yeah, basically, Seb, um, who was a project manager on the uh, on the system, he was uh, talking to a supplier um, of a water tank company. Yeah, and uh, rather unfortunately, after a very long title or long email, Seb's judgment may have lapsed, or he just didn't realise. And it's an honest things things happen when you're typing fast and. Yeah, he, uh, rather than asking for a 20,000 litre water tank, he asked for a wank tank. So, <laughs> Go on, the boy. Yeah. I hate telling that story as well, man, because Seb's like bang on all the time. Like, wank it's not tank. even, it's not because, like, Ooh. yeah, Seb, Seb's like, yeah, professionally inadequate, not at all. Like, he's been on point solid in the whole time. I know That's that. a belter. But yeah, in that case, he does, uh, he does joke about it, you know, but, um, yeah, that's about the only mistake Seb ever made. So I can live good with that, save, to be honest. Good save for Seb. Yeah. Seb, we love you, mate. Yeah, I have to it. bring it up because it's funny. <laughs> Imagine that professional email. Yours and silly best wishes. Yeah. But we've had to like learn everything from ground zero on that as well. Like you're doing your current job and then you're having to learn how to mm. put in like high heat systems and how to do water loops to like program basically how water is distributed around the site and uh, lots of stuff. Like, Mate, uh, it's full science. And, I, and like, do, you, do you know what? I think we, obviously we've got the trade show coming up in the next few weeks, I think. Yeah. Once that is sort of done and dusted and people start seeing what is coming, I think it would warrant maybe us talking about it a bit more because... Okay. But I it might melt your brain and you might not want me because of that. <laughs> the science you're talking has melted my very inferior brain. Or It's like going back to school. I love it. I feel it enriches me. <laughs> um, yeah, the product that you're talking about, I reckon people may may have a good educated guess as to what that is. But like you say, I think there will there'll definitely be another podcast in the future after you've caught the wood common and the long common <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. But And then we can talk about this too. But that's exciting. That's one factory one lot of machinery, and then you said that there's another site. Yeah, so... That can't be another product, can it? Um, it's bettering a product that we have always, that I feel that there's a hole in the market to a Ooh. degree. Well, not so much a hole. I think we have got a hole in the market that we haven't fulfilled to its full potential. So I wanted to produce something that could only not only supply the demand for it which we are not in full currently because of our growth but also it would mean that we can do more interesting products that maybe the fishing industry won't have seen in such a yeah in such a way maybe so give me so, a clue max because i'm lost here now oh i don't know whether i give too much away because it's just so i want I'm, uh, this is this is the thing. I've only just got the okay for it as well. Literally, like you're keeping this under wraps. Yeah, I've yeah. got it because uh, well, I don't want to lose yeah. this job. So we're yeah. going to gloss over that. But yeah. next, but podcast. it'll it'll come out. You'll see it. Well, all being well with with what um, myself, Kevin, and Leon have agreed, we're we're looking to basically bring out a full range of it by sort of May June time next year. Okay. So, so I'll have it, I'll be in the premises by October. So that'll be factory free. Busy. And, but there, this trade show wise, they'll, that won't be available at trade show for retailers. No, there'll, no. No, there'll be 21 products available at trade show for Oof, retailers. Exciting. Um, seven of which have never been done before in fishing. <gasps> never been done yeah. before. They Big follow words. a very similar process, but they're not, they've never been done. So, no, mate, mate, it's exciting. Not only have you smashed the normal side of bait factory stuff and Brexit, but from what I've seen, and it's been even limited in what I've seen, but in terms of the plans and conversations that have gone on, it's pretty mega, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But it's not done. Like, the grand plan's still there. It's never done for <laughs> no, does it? I'd, but, I'd you know, sit back there, have yeah. a cup of tea, and roast dinner and think, <laughs> I've done pretty well here. Yeah, I mean. well, like, I suppose... For I think I've been at, I'll be at, would have been at Nash for five years in ne- the end of this year, and yeah, well, it's gone well. <laughs> so it's gone well. Yeah, on to life things. Boy, mm-hmm. been born. What did you say? Five months now. Yeah, I was born on what's March twenty second. So what's that? April, May, June. Yeah, five months. Like, August. Yeah. 
Talk to me about the life changer that is your first child, Max. What's that been like? And I didn't know how it was going to be. I'm not going to profess to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to smash it and be um, like really good at this no like lack of sleep thing because I don't sleep very well anyway or whatever. But when you look in their eyes and they smile or they just you're just with them, like nothing else matters. Yeah. I'm never tired when I'm with him. Like if, yeah. I'm, if I've got him on my arms, I'm never tired. Like it's almost like he wakes me up. It's really strange. It's but yeah, yeah, I love it. I think it's, it is, um, for, fortunately or unfortunately to a degree, yeah, fishing's complete backseat, but I, I don't miss it at the moment at all. No. I'll, I'll take my little chances when I can yeah. and enjoy them. And I love talking about fishing. That's why I'm in this industry because I love it. But yeah, right now, like he is number one. Like, Love it. Uh, yeah. Any funny slash not so um, textbook dad moments with regards to nappies? Oh, definitely. Sick. Loads of them. <laughs> yeah. So he's not really very sick. Oh, which result. is a touch. Yeah. Doesn't really do that. But what he does, <laughs> I've heard him do a small wispy fart before. Oh, and yeah. then he's, when I'm changing his nappy, and then he's proceeded to bosh one out. But I literally, rather than it go all over the rug, I've literally caught it in the palm of my hands, like a whole Good baby hands. poo. But then been like, wait a sec, that's poo. Like, you don't normally just grab a poo and it flies out, do you? God, so I'm yeah. like sat there going, like trying to run around with it, thinking, what the hell do I do? What? <laughs> so yeah, that was a mistake. But also, like, sounds really strange, but when it's your own kid, you don't care. No. And also, you don't even really realise the smell that bad. But um, no. yeah, I was literally crying with laughter. Like me and Charlotte, my half was literally just like, Dying with laughter. Save. Yeah, I know. But then Charlotte did it like a week later and it went everywhere. Like it just went off. So I think you've got to accept that. It's going to happen, isn't it? You know, like, if it doesn't, you've had a minor miracle. Like yeah. no sick is brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Mate. He's only, I think he's only ever been sick like three times, but it's like nothing, you know, he's like, so that's good. You know, not loads cleaning up. But, I hate that. What a good, yeah. one absolute lad. Yeah. He's good. Really good. Oh, brilliant. Mate. He's probably actually been a blessing to a degree and maybe I've like got this jaded view of parenthood and maybe actually like have another one and there'll be an absolute terror and I'll be like oh that's what it's really like but it's not their fault they're, they're babies they're well, made, I they? think so. Max Henry said another one so <laughs> yeah. if you want a sound bite this Mrs <laughs> Henry you can take that <laughs> to the bank um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I always said one and done so let's see how oh, right, then. then you're alright then mate happy day yeah. job done well I said it but yeah, let's see how it goes but it's good life is good but very busy but most importantly you wouldn't change anything for the world not right now, no. I think I'm in a good place and I've got lots of things that I want to do. Um, maybe um, I have a issue with being impatient because I want stuff to happen not in 10 years, but I want it to happen in two or I'll aim for it to happen in two and it will take five or whatever, but I just need to learn to be patient. But I've never been very good at just That's not stopping. you though, is no, it, mate? But that's what you've got to learn sometimes because in an ideal world, I'd go to Kevin and go, I want three million pounds <laughs> and I want to do all of this. I've tried that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it doesn't work. I just went with the three million pounds. I'm not going to try anything else. <laughs> just just want to get paid. <laughs> People don't need to listen to my voice on this podcast anymore. Uh, it doesn't work. That was a silence agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can silence me for free. It wouldn't even take three million, let's face it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, obviously I understand, like, um, I need to manage my expectations for the reason that we have to run the business and benefit and then work it up and scale up as we go, which is cool. Like I just need to learn to be patient. That's all. You love it, mate. I think it's a fascinating mindset. I think whatever you did, you would have, you'd smash it. Wouldn't you? Because you are just relentless. Yeah. But you can't, you, I, I'm, I'm impressed. And again, don't take this as an insult. I'm impressed with how you can go into dad life and then into factory life and sort of work life because before when I've sort of spent some time with you, it's been relentless and absolute pathway to success, but only like quite restricted tunnel vision on one thing. Yeah. I've got to count myself lucky really because Charlotte has been quite understanding of my mental. Yeah. I'm just not right wide. Right. No, I don't think that at all. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you're not wide, right. I'm saying, 
if you are going to design a human being to be wired for sort of success, that's exactly the mindset you've got to have. Yeah. Like you are, they're, they're, it's absolutely textbook, like mental, like, but brilliant in a brilliant capacity, not in a self-destructive manner or anything like that, mate, because mm. you're doing it and you're smashing it. Yeah, I think um, Pete, my um, purchasing um, assistant across at Burnham, he's um, he's quite funny because he, sometimes I talk about stuff and he just goes, like, you're exhausting. <laughs> like, and you're a dad. <laughs> like, come on. Like you need to just rein it in, but yeah, no, there's mate. there's points. Like at the moment, I am burning it hard. I just want to crack it and get this new factory right. And but then my issue is, I go to that. I say that to Charlotte, and then she'll go. But then you'll say about this, and then you'll say about this. It and never it's end. never ending. Yeah, and this is one day. I think it might do though. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, maybe it'd be nice. I think it? when the nice. grand plan is executed, I think that might be. I don't know if there'll be a resketch of grand plan two. No, think you'll be happy. No, that's it. I don't. I'd like to think so. I think, um, yeah, I've just got this like plan, and I'll stick to it and see where it gets to a successful level, and um, see where we're at from there. And scattering a few forty pounders every now and again. Yeah, that's fifty it. pounders. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> you do. What's the weather like? Good. What are we looking at? It's all right at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you can't complain at this. If it's too sunny, they just sit in the weed, don't That's they? That's what so. I mean. You don't want it sunny. And the whole lake's weed, <laughs> literally. Yeah, it's not big. Oh, uh, it's no, big. the weed grows out of the water. It's that thick. <laughs> like, it's mad. What a place. So I remember like Crowey had it. I remember speaking to Crowey shortly after he had it. We did yeah. a, a live together, I think. And um, yeah, unbelievable the photos of that thing. Just yeah. either of them would be wicked. I hope you get them, mate. Yeah. I really do. Um, mate, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a whistle stop tour of a very action packed, sort of heavy work wise couple of years almost since your last one. And we'll definitely get you back in. I hope it's been interesting. That- it's just so, uh, yeah, it's strange really because obviously with the fishing, we're a fishing podcast, but there is a lot that goes into doing what we do. So, but I think that's that's sort of almost overlooked with regards to uh, sometimes we paint a, a sort of a very like rose tinted picture of what working in the industry is people think like you're fishing all the time you're getting filmed fishing all the time but the reality is you need that passion because it's long hours it's a lot of hard work and conversely if you if you and, and i had a chat with a bloke who does social media for for man united comparatively you look at the actual income within the industry that people are making in those roles and it's nowhere near what people think it is, especially in comparison to people who are in football, mm. big industries. It's like four or five times the wages. So you've got to love it. You've got to put the hard work in to be successful. And and that's what it's all about, really, isn't it? But we yeah, are fortunate, it. mate, because we work in fishing. Yeah, that's it. Living the dream. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Before you go, quick five questions, Max. I don't oh. know if you've seen these. I you think you sent me them, but I completely forgot. So I'm going to have to be clever now, aren't I? Better. I didn't think you'd read this at all. You haven't read this at all, have you? I have, yeah. I've read the first like 20 lines because that's not Hi, mate. Email. Here's the plan for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, Kick that's off it. around Stop. about <laughs> midday. Stop. And then you thought, oh, he's chatting absolute bubbles. Um, right. Three words to describe yourself. Driven. Friendly. Nice. Approachable. Oh, lovely. 24 hours with no sleep or 24 hours with no food. Which one are you choosing? Oh, I could easily get up. Uh, as long as I've got food, I don't. 24 hours is minor. But you need food? Yeah, I need food. Okay. <laughs> um, a four-day session or four separate one-day sessions, what are you taking? Uh, f- four days on the bank, that'd be nice. That'd be like the biggest treat of my, well, since last year when I went to Fit Pool. There you go. Um, particle or boily? You've got to pick one. Boily does everything, so. Nice. Hook, bait, colour choice, bright or match the hatch? Um, match the hatch, more consistent for everywhere. Nice. Um, three famous people you'd invite to a session. They, they could be alive or dead. They don't have to be anglers. It could be anyone. It's broad. Fly me. Elon Musk. Elon, well, yeah, that'd be a good one, wouldn't it? Yeah, just because I don't know. I think he'll probably find me intellectually minor, like a minor. So we probably wouldn't talk about much, but I thought it'd be interesting. I reckon you're on the same level, boys. No. I reckon no that'd chance. be 
That'd be some conversation. I'm not worth 180 billion, so... <laughs> you know, it's because you do bait, right? you know what I mean? If you did, elect, <laughs> like, electric cars or something, you'd be all right. Yeah, maybe. One day. <laughs> um, I don't really know a lot of famous people. Or think of, I don't really watch telly these days either, so... It could be dead, mate. It could be fake. It could be like, dead. Figures in history could be anything. Muhammad Ali. Oh, that'd be a good one. Yeah. I reckon he'd like a bit of fishing back in the day, mate. Yeah, I reckon. Um, and... I don't know. Walt Disney. Walt Disney? Yeah. Right out there. Yeah. So just for the lad to get like a Well, bit I just of... figure out they have loads of conspiracies that he's um he's been def- he's been f- uh, frozen. So I just yeah, want to know whether they either defrost him. Cryogenically <laughs> yeah. frozen. Or find out what the crack is because someone might not be living in 20... 20- Hundred or whatever it'll be, like that illustrates the different level that you are on, Henry. <laughs> you want to know about his cryogenic freezing? I want to know that I get some free toys for my kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, where are we? Uh, biggest inspiration? Ooh. Inspiration. These aren't quick fire questions, Hassan. Because I'm are, just rubbish mate. at them. No, but... they're good quick fire questions. These, mate. I'm actually interested in the answers. Um, anyone, people inspire me if they become very good at what they do and they care. That's all. Like I don't, I don't have a person. Okay. I'm just inspired by people that put a lot of effort into what they do and become better for it in whatever they do. Like you. No. Yes, mate. But it's, yeah, it's other people inspire me. Drum and bass or country and western? Drum and bass. I can't believe that, if I'm honest, mate. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I've got like a raver side, I suppose, since, blimey, quite a long time ago. It's got to be a bit I used to go raving side. before Alan, like, before before um, I went, I came to Nash. Like, I used to talk to Alan about raves, like, when I was at <laughs> raves, you know? So, like, that, that's how long ago it was. I didn't, like, get pulled into it because of Nash, like... I've always been this way. I've always been this what, way. Is that the vice? Like, you, sort of crazy <laughs> raving? Is that the sort of let out steam yeah, side just, of Max Hendry? Uh, yeah, I do. I like bass, bass music, really, and that sort of thing. And yeah. You always seem quite controlled. I think there's got to be like a. Go home and like beat the cat. No? <laughs> no. Just rave music. Have you seen the film The Big Short? No, I don't. Think All I right. There's a guy called Michael Berry in it. Michael Berry is like this very, very. St- He's quite a warped guy, but he's very, very clever. And when he gets frustrated, he would like go in his garage and turn on some heavy metal music and whack drums, like just bang the drums like a nutcase. Whereas I don't do that. I would just play music loud, whether it, whatever it be, whether it be grime music, rap music, like drum and bass, I will just play something really loud and go for a drive and that will probably calm me down. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Fair play, that's quite a good way of managing it, mate. Yeah. Yeah, nice. rather than rather than just shouting. Rather than smash drums about kicking the cat. <laughs> um, uh, north or south? North being obviously near Lincolnshire and home. South being where you are now down here. Got to pick one. Um, if I was a relaxed person and wanted an easy, chi- uh, a more chilled out lifestyle, as in didn't sit on the roads getting aggravated by other road, truck road users or other road users getting aggravated by me, then I would live in the north because the south, that is very much the case. So you're basically picking the north. Well done, mate. Good. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, biggest angling myth you've heard? Could be bait related. Could not be. Oh, biggest angling myth. Oh. I don't know. I don't have a myth. Like... I don't have to kind of deal in fact. <laughs> that is... You must have heard someone chat absolute bobbins about something. Whether it's true or not, this might be a myth or it might be true, but I have not asked the, re- well, I don't know the person to ask them. But Tom Banks, who is very well, widely regarded in the, very, in the big carp scene, is has caught some of the best and biggest carp in the country and is the owner of Savvy. Ooh. He once caught Heather the lever on a bear hook over hemp seed, which would make sense. And he, also I hear that he may have had he, uh, got caught doing self-takes of Heather the lever oh, rather than with all the gang. 
and just slipping it back. But I don't know how true that is, and I couldn't poss- I wouldn't possibly want to slander anyone. But like I say, I believe that that is that happened. Yeah. So that that's that could be a myth, or it could not. Do you be know him? I don't know Tom Banks. Uh, no, he's like an enigma. Like when I worked for Advanced Carp, I actually he was like him and John Holt. They were like my ultimates yeah, to get on. Yeah. And I I don't think I never even came close. You know. Well, mate. But we'll maybe you can beat podcast. me. I, yeah. don't, I don't think I'll John Holt. Beat, I don't yeah, think I'll beat John you in Holt. anything, Kendry, mate. I think you are a winner, mate. Um, best piece of advice you've ever been given. Um, oddly enough, about the questions thing, there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. Nice. Last question. Night in with the missus and the nipper. We'll hit the lake on the end of a big pressure drop and a fresh southwesterly. No question at the moment for me. Definitely on the lake. Good boy. Well <laughs> No, it'll be like, leave at like half one when they've gone to bed. Go and do a few hours till first light and then come home and wake up with them. Is he asleep now? <laughs> yeah. he asleep? I think he's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Max, you're an absolute legend. Thank you so much for coming in, mate. Thank you all for watching and listening. I'm hopefully going to get Max back on in a, a short period of time when he's caught two immaculate commons from a very tricky Norfolk venue. It will happen, mate. Um, but thank you for that insight. You're an absolute legend, mate. If you dream it, you can do it. <laughs> you could want to, I <laughs> Cheers, mate. Thank you. <laughs>